it started here in south carolina the capital city is known as the heart of the midlands booming with business and coming soon signs it's the home of the championship gamecocks the stage for historic political battles but columbia is also an essential hub for many in neighboring rural towns whether it be work, shopping, or entertainment, it's a city where catching a ride to get from here to there isn't so hard to do. But for black Americans, that wasn't always the case. In the Jim Crow era, seating on public transportation was a visible reminder of racial injustices within communities across the country. Segregation rules on buses in Columbia meant that black passengers couldn't sit in the same row as or in front of white passengers. And when it comes to movements that paved the way for desegregation, you may have heard of the Montgomery bus boycott or Rosa Parks. But what about Sarah Mae Fleming? This is her story. Sarah Mae Fleming Brown is one of the unsung figures in the American civil rights movement. She was a woman who was born in the small community of Eastover, South Carolina, in the Lower Richland community. Daughter to Mac and Rosella Fleming, Sarah was raised during the peak of the Great Depression on the family's 188-acre farm. Like many blacks at the time, she was forced to drop out of school to work in order to help provide for her family. She worked in Columbia for a number of years as a housekeeper and a domestic. And she was living an average, normal life for an African-American woman in the age of segregation. In the 1950s, black women, especially in the South, didn't have much, if any, access to opportunity. For those who looked for work outside of the farm fields, being a maid, cook, or nanny was the hand that was dealt. But Sarah didn't realize her story would showcase her to be far more than the help. Ms. Fleming's story is not readily discoverable in textbooks or monuments, or in museums. But on June 22, 1954, she stepped into history. That summer morning, in the famous South Carolina heat, 20-year-old Sarah was en route to work at her job in the Five Points area of Columbia. The first stretch of her journey took over an hour. Once downtown, she transferred on a local city bus at the corner of Taylor and Main Street and stood while on board. Uh, and when the bus got to the corner of Maine and Hampton, a seat became available, a seat that was close to the front of the bus. And for whatever reason, that day, that morning, Miss Fleming sat down in that seat because the bus driver saw what was happening, and he looked in the mirror and demanded that this Negro woman move to the back of the bus. A demand that Sarah would refuse she had no intention to move to the back. Instead, she got up with one mission, to get off of the bus. And as she's leaving the bus, according to court testimony, she is struck, forcibly struck in the abdomen by the driver of this local bus. She is injured. Punched in the stomach. These kinds of attacks weren't uncommon across the South for black men, women, even children. The tragic news about what Sarah encountered spread quickly across town and came to the attention of civil rights activist and matriarch Majeska Simpkins. Ms. Simpkins put Ms. Fleming in contact with a young Jewish attorney named Philip Wittenberg. And they decided, given the circumstances, they were going to press charges against the bus driver and the operators of the bus. At the time, SCE&G had just become the first South Carolina corporation to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. One month following the incident, Wittenberg filed a suit on Fleming's behalf in federal court, asserting her 14th Amendment rights had been violated. Rights that were being challenged in every avenue of life for blacks. Just years prior, the Briggs versus Elliott case out of Somerton became one of the five cases under Brown versus Board of Education that ultimately ruled separate but equal public education was unconstitutional. This gave hope that even if at a slow pace, the movement was gaining some traction. Every black person in this country knew of that case, knew of its power and its impact. And I like to believe that Ms. Fleming knew. And the courts ruled that because segregation 
is deemed unconstitutional on public buses, then let the dominoes fall. And that is the argument Ms. Fleming's attorneys use when they take this case to the courts, that the courts have ruled already that this is unconstitutional in public schools. We argue that it's unconstitutional on buses. On June 21st, the NAACP and future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall joined two local attorneys for an appeal by the U.S. Fourth Circuit Court. Almost a month later, the court overruled Timmerman, stating the old doctrine that separate but equal facilities for Negroes are constitutional can no longer be regarded law. That decision was not easily accepted in South Carolina. In this state, there was, there were dire consequences. In this state, people were penalized. People suffered because they spoke out. And Sarah Mae Fleming understood that. I was a person that was on the scene capturing events that no one else was capturing at the time. I became a correspondent for Jet Magazine when I was about 18 years old. And even though the uh, black press covered many of the stories and things happening in South Carolina, the mainstream and white press did not. The photograph that exists of Sarah Mae Fleming was done by my mentor, E.C. Jones, and also uh, Mr. John Goodwin of uh, Columbia, South Carolina. He was a, a studio photographer in Columbia, and he photographed that um, very famous picture of uh, Sarah Mae Fleming along with her attorneys, I think, coming out of the courthouse when the trial took place. She's standing next to two of her attorneys whose names were Matthew J. Perry and Lincoln C. Jenkins. And when the reporters asked her about her thoughts regarding her moment in history... She said it was the right thing to do. I only hope it won't lead to trouble. And that reminds me of good trouble. And as you can see, June's My father and Sarah were first cousins. We didn't know her as Sarah. Okay. Um, we called her Kitty, um, and we kept, we didn't know why we'd given the nickname, um, but her brother Odell Fleming said that she was afraid of cats, and they started calling her Kitty. And so, in 1954, um, all I knew as I grew up was Kitty. And it just so happened that several of Sarah's family members were employed by the utility company. My father and my uncle and even my brother work for SCE&G, and we did not realize that there had been a case where they were suing SCE&G and the bus driver for what they had done to Sarah May. Um, and even though that could have been a departure from family life, it never entered into the picture. She was so private. Um, that it took others to tell her story. I think it was in about 95 when the story came out and we went, we didn't know that. And um, th so then we saw the video and we, they came out for interviews and all of those things. And we started asking questions and even her grandchildren did not know. While the trial was underway in 1956, Sarah married a gentleman named John Brown. They had three children. Miss Fleming's moment took place June 22nd, 1954. That's 17 months before December 1st, 1955, when Rosa Parks sits down on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. I think the, the intentional burying of stories like Sarah Mae Fleming gives the impression that there was no real movement in South Carolina. It gives the impression that black people were satisfied with the condition of segregation and Jim Crow injustice. Back in South Carolina, white lawmakers continued their pushback. Judge Timmerman would subsequently preside over two state trials in 1956 and 1957, both with all white, all male jurors. During the night of the first trial in June of 56, Fleming Brown's attorney, Philip Wittenberg, had an eight-foot cross burned in his yard by the Ku Klux Klan. Timmerman dismissed the case the following day before the defense could present witnesses.
But that one battle didn't stop the fight. Attorneys for Fleming Brown successfully appealed to the U.S. Fourth Circuit Court once again, who sent the case back to Timmerman. The final trial proceeded to jury deliberations on June 11th, 1957. And after just 30 minutes, the jury decided that SCE and G still owed Sarah nothing. Throughout the rest of her life, Sarah rarely spoke about the case. Um, she grew up in the community and in the, in the church, and they have her grave is outside in the church graveyard and there's nothing on it to say she was a heroine. Um, there was nothing about what she did or what she, it was never spoken of. She felt so badly about it. And even when she went to the Supreme Court, she did not see that as being victorious. She saw that as being an embarrassment, that she was punched in the stomach by the bus driver, forced to get off, and that those things happened to her. How do you feel about that? What would you say to Kitty if, if she, you could tell her it's okay? Or what, what would you say to her about that feeling of feeling embarrassed? I'm proud that she stood up. I'm proud that she took it as far as she did. And I wish I could tell her that now it's, it's a badge of courage. And so we thank you for taking that step and I'm glad to follow in your footsteps. We carry now that badge and we share it with our children and our grandchildren.